Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk about the first ever match they attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, all the way from the other side of the world, David Squires, who's now based in Australia. David brightens up even the gloomiest football fan every Tuesday with his regular cartoons for The Guardian, as well as for other media. And last year, David was actually commissioned by the French sports title L'Equipe to turn his first ever match into a cartoon, which is where we will start, David. Hello, thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's a great honour and, a, and a, an introduction of someone who I don't recognise. So that's very, that's very kind of you. And yeah, so uh, earlier, when was it? Maybe a few months ago. Yeah, Lakeep, who I, I do a um, fortnightly cartoon for, uh, asked me to write uh, about my first ever football match, uh, which was Swindon versus Tranmere on the 3rd of March, uh, 1984, in the Canon League Division 4. Got to remember the sponsors, Canon, of course. <laughs> And um, and I was one. I was one of. I was with my dad, and we were two of uh, two thousand two hundred ninety-five people on a um, quite a sunny afternoon at the county ground. The sun always shines on the county ground. Of course it does. Of course it does. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it was a one-all draw featuring two own goals. I don't actually I have to say I don't really remember much about the game itself. I, I just remember the result and one or two other things I guess we'll we'll talk about. Um the football wasn't particularly memorable as um as you'll have seen from the um from the, the short video clip on the um the excellent Swindon Town resource uh online, the history uh, website, uh which has it's just a treasure trove for well, I say that. Anyone who isn't a Swindon fan will probably not not consider it to be a treasure trove but it does include moments of comedy including the highlights of this particular game um as i say one or draw two own goals um and yeah a classic a modern cla- well not modern it's 40 years ago but you know i can still remember bits of it yeah i think um any listeners who want to spend two hour, two minutes, sorry, 15 seconds of their time, you do have to look up this video because not only is the football, as you say, a treasure trove usually involves gems and beauty. I wouldn't call it beautiful. I, I think, as you say, there is an emphasis on comedy. The two own goals are absolute classics. Um, but also the commentary from the local TV reporter, the angst in his voice, the, the the horror of what had happened at the county ground in March 1984 is, is just worth anyone's time. So I, I really suggest you go to that. Just talk to us a little bit more about your experience of going, you know, because you went with your dad and how that transpired and, you know, the little bits and pieces is what we look at in this podcast, the not not necessarily the action on the pitch. It's quite a lot of it is what happened to you, your personal experience. Yeah. So so talk us through that, David. So my dad, as you say, my dad took me for the game. Dad isn't a football fan. He has he's not a sports fan. He has zero interest in sport to the point of hostility. Uh, <laughs> and um like he during the, the uh Euro finals England versus Italy a couple of years ago but he, he made a point of going and sitting in his shed for a couple of hours rather than uh, while mum watched it on the telly uh he came out here to well they both came out to visit me a couple of years ago here in Australia and our house backs onto a field and um he was out there having a look and I don't know a bit later in the day he came and said to me um what's the big H in that field and I had no idea what he was talking about because there's a big H out there and I went and had a look, and it was rugby posts. He just I didn't even have the concept of, <laughs> of what it was. I think he thought it was the start of a Hollywood sign. Um, so, yeah, that gives you sort of an, an idea of how little interest he has in sport. Um, but at some point between 
the 1982 World Cup, where I had no interest in football either, and the 1983 FA Cup final, I became obsessed. Like most, I just I fell hard and fell quickly. Um, I think he was probably quite bemused about that because before then I was probably into the same things that he was into. He's a very sort of technical guy, and you know he's always building things. And um, he's the person who encouraged me to draw because he loves to draw as well. And I think if you've got someone in your life who encourages you down that path, you you always sort of um, you'll stick at it. Um, so I think he's always been a bit oh, disappointed that I, that I go into football. But to his credit, he um, he succumbed to what was probably a long campaign of um, pleading but on my behalf to, to take me along and watch a local team, Swindon Town, who at the time, it wasn't an attractive prospect. Like this was before things really took an upturn for Swindon. In fact, this was um, coming towards the end of their worst ever season. Uh, when well, they finished seventeenth uh, eventually in Division Four, so Dad took me along, and like, an illustration of how little, how we just didn't know how it worked. He had no interest, um, so we we went into the we had tickets in the North Stand, which was and remains the most boring uh, area of the of the of the county ground. It's, it, at the time, it would have been the only seated stand, and we went in there, allocated tickets. And our seats were in the uh, in the enclosure at sort of really right down at one end. And even he, with his limited knowledge of sport, realised that with the goals at both ends, you're probably better off in the middle. So he moved us along. We shuffled along sort of down towards the middle of the main stand. I remember him lifting me over like a small steel ornate fence into some much nicer seats, which were, you know, red and plush and leather and you know, we realised these were much better. And we probably sat there for maybe two or three minutes before a man in a fluorescent jacket came along and asked us to see our tickets. And we were swiftly ushered back to the uh, to the cheap seats. But um, so, yeah, that's that's one of the things that I remember. He, Dad would have enjoyed the fact there were two own goals because um, the only really the interest he derived from sports from sport in fact from most things his life is when things go wrong so he enjoys calamity and and failure that those i mean that's like catnip for him the like one of the own goals like one of the own goals was the swindon goal was credited to uh gary nelson i see on online because it was a it, they say he scored directly from a corner but when you look back at the video and um yeah, it really looks like the, the the defender chins it in, right? Um, but anyway, he probably would have enjoyed that. Um, and the, o- the other main visceral thing I remember about this game isn't really to do with the action on the pitch or anything like that. It was, We went to the toilet at half time, or at some point during the game going to the toilet and there was no one else in the, but there was a man urinating in the sink. <laughs> like unless he was unfortunate enough that there'd been a crowd of people who had yeah. suddenly left <laughs> but it didn't seem like there was anyone else there but i just remember seeing a, a man a full and bear in mind i was uh nine i think and um yeah i'd never seen a man urinating in this thing before or since so um th- those are the kinds of things that leave uh an indelible mark on the on the memory yeah i can imagine that and hopefully not on your shoes because i've seen you know i've been to football grounds where the loos are completely full and people are bored waiting for the rivals so you, you know yep. the odd one not me uh goes in the sink but i've never seen an empty loo and someone <laughs> you know that could have been the choice so um I'd love to interview him if you could track him down. <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll have, I did, yeah, I took his details, so I'll pass them on, and we'll, um, of course, yeah, we yeah. remain firm friends. Yeah, I think that could be an offshoot. It started with a piss. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, um, yeah, I want to go back to that first goal because, as you say, on the official report, I think it says Gary Nelson swung it in directly from a corner, but actually. There was definitely at least one touch from a Tranmere player. Mm-hmm. And from my view, it seemed to hit 
one of the few internationals on the pitch who was Di Davis, who's a Welsh international, Tranmere yeah. goalkeeper. And it seems to smack him pretty full smack on the nose, hands nowhere near it, and then just sort of <laughs> rather apologetically trickles into the net. So I, I, I go for own goal. As you say, what we're looking for here yeah. and what is absolutely streamed throughout the whole thing is comedy and, you know, some black comedy, let's say. Um, but that was, I, I, I would have definitely call that an own goal from what I've seen. Um, and talking of own goals, we need to move on to about half an hour into the game, Swindon having taken an early lead. And what happened next with um, Colin Bailey? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he just launches it past his own goalkeeper. It's uh, And it says in in the commentary, as he, you alluded to, that the guy on the HTV Sport who <laughs> sounds like he needs some Prozac, he just sounds like he just completely demoralised by the whole experience. And he says that it's the Colin Bailey's second own goal in three matches, which, you know, I guess it happens to everyone. But at what point, I suppose, as a footballer, do you start thinking, well, oh, this is going to happen every game. This is my life now. Um, who is that Chelsea player who scored was it two, two own goals in one game? I can't remember. This is in the 90s. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, but, was it um, Frank Sinclair, possibly? Yeah, Frank Sinclair. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He, I mean, he only did that once, but still, you know, here at... Two men on a podcast, <laughs> twenty-five years later, or whatever, still trying to remember who he was. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, poor old Colin. I don't remember Colin really as as a as a Swindon player. That just sort of looking through the the lineups, there are a few that stuck around at Swindon who enjoyed sort of the up upward trajectory after after this season. Like Jimmy Quinn was one of the other internationals on the pitch. He went on to have a a decent career and Swindon sold him at the end of that season to Blackburn for presumably for some money. So that was pretty good. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and Dave Hockaday was in the, the Swindon lineup as well, who he rose through the, the divisions with Swindon and probably recognizable to, to most most fans now as the um as Leeds United's most famous recent manager, probably just Pippin Bielsa in the affections of Leeds fans. Um <laughs> Yeah, so there were yeah, a few. With Hockaday, and, yeah. yeah. Sorry, with Hockaday, I was trying to think of a more Swindon-esque name than David Hockaday, and I couldn't <laughs> really come up. He he could only play for Swindon. I know he moved to other clubs, but he is a Swindon player in my mind. Uh, as you say, Jimmy Quinn did go on to do other stuff and was an international. I think I'm right in saying he had three spells at Swindon, so this was his first one. He came back. Yeah, that's right after he'd been to Blackburn. And then he think he had a great period when he, he was probably in his 30s. Players now, you know, when they get to their 30s, move to Saudi Arabia to earn money. But Jimmy Quinn, no, 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 no. He went back to the county ground. So so good on yep. Jimmy. Um, the, the, mecca, there, there the, real, the real mecca, I did say. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Know, the football, football mecca, yeah. He, yeah. yeah, he. so the third time, he, the second time he was there, he was fantastic, amazing. Um, and we sold him again to Leicester. The third time he came back was as player manager, um, but really no one expected him to play, but there was such a dearth of talent and there's a bit of an injury crisis. He picked himself and he was, I think I'm right in saying he was 40 when he picked himself for a couple of games and we got relegated. We are in the championship that season or uh, division one, I guess it would have been called then or the first division. And um, that's the season we got relegated in 1999-2000, and we haven't been back since. So, yeah, there's a tinge of sadness about about Jimmy Quinn for Swindon fans. Indeed. Um, and actually, as you say, looking through the lineup, um, I've also interested to see there's a guy who I really have no concept of what he was like. But his name was Kevin Badley. And considering how poorly Swindon played, I thought that's also a great name. Um, one other, as we just 
already mentioned the man who swung in the corner that smashed in off Di Davis's nose was Gary Nelson, who, um, you know, be, wasn't a great footballer, but became pretty well known in his post-football career because of his writing. And in fact, I did look in my l little library here and there is his book, Left Foot Forward, which I must say is one of the best books written by a footballer. I mean, it's not a particularly high bar, but it's actually quite realistic. It's not, um, doesn't pump up his tyres, just talks a little bit about how shit being a footballer is. So yeah. that that's actually quite a, a refreshing read. I would suggest again to readers, if, you, if you're going to ever buy a football book by a footballer, that would be a good one. Um, so do you do you remember Gary Nelson as a player developing and obviously having this, you know, sight of how to write a book? Was he that sort of footballer? Uh, I don't really remember much of him as a footballer, I have to admit. But when uh, I did, yeah, I read Left Foot Forward, like most other football fans around the time. And he does talk quite candidly about his time at Swindon. And I think he found it tough, didn't he, under Lee Macari, who came in the following season, who was all about fitness and running and, you know, quite a disciplinarian. And um, I don't think that was, you know, Gary Nelson's thing, but he went on and did well at Charlton, didn't he? And yeah, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. That, that book is so honest and, um, and, you know, we've all read a lot of football, football um, autobiographies and, you know, it's always, you know, then, it's usually successful players, for one, talking about, you know, how great they are, how they, needless to say, had the laugh, laugh kind of um, anecdotes. But, yeah, Gary Nelson was pretty um, uh, honest and, yeah, pretty frank about, you know, it's not always so glamorous being a, being a footballer, um, particularly at Swindon, yeah. The other player in that game who really st stands out for Swindon fans is Andy Rowland. Um, who had it? He was with the club for for years and years, and you know, much loved by Swindon fans. And he um, he felt he was um, he would have been at the club for about twenty odd years, I think, when Steve McMahon came in as manager. And in one of Steve McMahon's regular calls of um, popular or people who were popular with the fans, Andy Rowland got the chop, and yeah. And actually, Steve McMahon got the chop not long after that. And, um, yeah, he didn't like anyone, or at least the perception was that McMahon didn't like anyone who was more popular than him or the fan base, which was a long list of people, it should be said. <laughs> Going back to the video, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep referring to this video because, as I say, it's yeah. something that is it's imprinted. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about this video. <laughs> um they talk about the fact that Swindon had 90% of the time. I think they actually, the, the reporter actually starts saying they should have won five or six nil, um, which maybe has a certain amount of local bias to it. But, <laughs> you know, they then show uh, a, a little package of the misses um, with a lovely soundtrack of Nancy Sinatra singing, these boots are made for walking. And what struck me about the video apart from what was on the pitch, was, you know, the odd look at the terraces. And as you say, I think there were two and a half thousand people there. And the county ground is not the smallest ground in the world. It looks so sparse. Uh, and I, I'm sure I see a couple of people chuckling because of the, the <laughs> comedy that's going on in front of them. Yep. So, you know, what are your memories of the ground, apart from the guy weeing in the sink, the fact that you and your dad moved to the VIP seats and were quickly jettisoned. Your view of the county ground, because it's still, you know, still there. It's, you know, I'm sure it hasn't developed that much, but what the county ground meant then and how it's developed for you, because clearly, you know, you've retained your affection for Swindon. The It hasn't really changed, to be honest. There's... Of, of the four stands, three of them are the same as um, as, a, as the day that I was there. It's um, the only difference is that at both ends of the stadium, they they bolted on some red plastic seats onto the um, uh, onto the, 
the concrete terracing in the uh, early 90s and uh they added uh, a block of seats in front of um in front of the, the the main stand where i was sat but other than that apart from a few sort of cosmetic changes uh it's broadly the same the only difference is on the opposite side of the ground was the old Trivenham road stand which is um had a green corrugated iron um covering like a roof games are often postponed because uh swindon's got a windy place and on those windy afternoons there would be sheets of green corrugated iron flying off and they'd have to postpone games and um they it, that was a, a that was terracing with a small seated area at the top of wooden seats uh, which they closed um at some point in the 80s probably i suspect after the bradford fire and i mentioned that the only like no one in my family is really interested in football apart from uh, my granddad who used to go and sit up there in the most hazardous part of the stadium and he stopped when they condemned that part of the ground as a fire hazard he said oh, no, i'm not going anymore and that was it I and mean, he never went again um i think he enjoy, must have enjoyed the adrenaline rush of um of being up there <laughs> with the, with the stand flapping around but um but after a so after that first game I worked with my dad he wasn't keen to take me very often so I'd go occasionally with um with friends and their dads and it took me a while to sort of find my group of friends uh school friends when we we're old enough to you know go to games independently and we'd always go and stand on the other side of the stadium on underneath that that uh the Shivenham Road underneath the gray uh, green corrugated iron uh stand and I remember absolutely everything about that terrace. I remember the um, the iron girder with the word stab <laughs> graffitied on it. I remember <laughs> the, the the crush barrier that we'd, we'd stand on every week or, you know, lean against them. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the good thing about it is I can still draw the stadium exactly from memory. And it's it's <laughs> it's almost, you know, accurate to today because very little has changed. Um but yeah, I mean, so many people have come in over the years. Uh, um, you know, owners have come in and promising to to redevelop the ground, and it really hasn't happened. They've only just been able to buy it back from the council. They sold it to the council at some, uh, I think it was late seventies, early eighties. I could be wrong, um, but a long time ago. It took a, it's taken them years to to get it back, and they were only really able to thanks to. Um, uh, a wealthy Swindon fan who um, who left the supporters trust a, a load of money in his will, uh, Nigel Eady, who's a local farmer, and that money um, aided the club in in buying the stadium back. So you would hope that things might change a bit, but at the same time, if there's any like huge changes to it, and I can't draw it from memory, I'll be slightly traumatized because in my head it's still exactly the same as it was, you know, when I lived in England and would. Uh, you know would go regularly so um but but yeah the, it probably does need at least a, a lick of paint i would suggest yeah and possibly take off stab is a stab i mean apart from the obvious is it something to do with swindon town ab or was that just uh yeah you know, i found out later it stood for swindon town agro boys which i guess was the uh was the local was the the local hooli firm but um yeah I mean that that all went above my head. I mean, literally, it was above my head. It was, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think um, I want to refer there because as when you started going, um, you know, you went to that first game with your dad, and then he said uh, he he'd had enough comedy in his life. He doesn't need to see any more own goals or people urinating in sinks. So he he said no thanks and. Tell us a little bit about the fact that then, you know, that was pretty much the height of hooliganism in English football. Yeah. And your dad, rather than saying, don't go, encouraged you to go. Talk us a bit about that. Yeah, he. Uh, well, mum and dad, like the, the, they're both, uh, I think, by their own mission, would admit that they're warriors and, um, you know, very protective. Um but weirdly, they were OK when I started going to football with just my mates a couple of years later, like mid 80s. And I do remember there being a lot of crowd trouble when particularly when we play Reading and Oxford and Bristol City, there 
there would always be trouble. I remember particularly one year playing Reading and just a rain of coins flying between, you know, the two terraces and Swindon were on their way up then. So it was, you know, there are a lot more people there than the, the two and a half thousand at the Tramere game. And yeah, just people leaving with blood all over them. And, you know, I can't remember. I, I, I expect I probably didn't tell my mum and dad about that. I'd come home and they'd say, do you have a nice time? Yeah, yeah, it was good. You know, one, three, nil. Um, <laughs> change of conversation quickly. Um, so, yeah, it, but it took me a while. To, like there was probably the following season after this game in 84, I started going with a friend and his dad. I only went with them a couple of times. The first time I went with them, again, we went in the North Stand, the sort of most sedate sort of stand. And as we were going in, I remember him saying to my friend and I, you're at the football now, so you can say what you want. And my friend said, what, swearing? And he goes, yep, say what you want, which is like to a 10-year-old boy, <laughs> it's like being given the keys to, you know, uh the Wonka factory kind of thing so yeah. we absolutely abuse that privilege and I do remember people just looking around at these small children saying the worst words you can imagine um I think that was against Wigan I think which I mean you know Swindon versus Wigan is enough to inspire anyone to to explore <laughs> the bluer end of the vocabulary um so yeah and then Probably would have been the um, 86, 87 season where I, I was going every game, I think. Um, and really that stayed the case for many years, probably until I left to go to university in 94. So, and during that time, Swindon rose through to the divisions, um, firstly under Lou Macari, who came in the season after after my first game. Um and then after him, yeah, Ozzy Ardiles, Glenn Hoddle. And yeah, so just so lucky that my teenage years coincided with with that upward rise. Um, and unfortunately, although it did sort of give me an unrealist, unrealistic um, view of Swindon's place in the football universe. So now I'm permanently, I have it in my head that, you know, with this sleeping giant just waiting for to do a Luton, I suppose you'd say now. And, you know, I look at the Premier League and I see, you know, Bournemouth voting against giving, you know, uh, compensation payments to the EFL. And I think you're Bournemouth. Get back in your box. <laughs> yeah. I know you've got, you know, a billionaire multi-club owner, but yeah. get back down here. There are there are a few clubs up there who I think, yeah, like, like Brentford as well. I know everyone's, they are tremendously well run fine but you're Brentford the natural yeah. order is that at least in my head which is set in 1991 92 93 is that uh Swindon Oldham and Wimbledon should be in the Premier League and um mm -hmm. yeah Bournemouth Brentford Brighton should be um you know back in League One I hope that none of the, I hope none of the, actually no I hope their fans do listen to this and realize well, as a Palace fan, I could only agree with you that Brighton should okay. be nowhere near the Premier League. Uh, Brentford comically are called uh, just a bus stop in Hounslow by certain people uh, who could be Fulham fans. And as you say, Bournemouth, I mean, they've got a capacity of 11,000. What, what's that all about? You know, it's, and, and Luton also have obviously a very small ground. But as you said, you you, you feel that, you know, Early part of the Premier League, Wimbledon, clearly they'd been in Division One. You then had Oldham, and then, then you had Swindon, and you raised Swindon in the Premier League. And I'm afraid we are going to have to just go through that because that's fine. Um, sorry about this, and uh, you know, I'll, no. I'll offer you counselling later and we'll get <laughs> someone in. But, um, just, just looking at the trajectory, as you say, because you were in the golden period, so. When Lou Macari took over, he suddenly took them to fourth division championship in 85, 86. And then you had a run at the playoffs. Someone who's written a book about the playoffs obviously going to raise the playoffs. So you actually got promoted in the first ever season of the playoffs. Do you have any recollection of that? I remember uh, 
remember the the games against Gillingham in the mm-hmm. um yeah in the playoff final, which then was two legged, and um, I think if the away goal rule had been in place, Gillingham would have won. Um, right. And the Swindon Gillingham thing is uh, that's another weird one of fo- English football's weird grudges, I suppose, because there's no. I guess people sort of talk about Brighton and Palace as well as being quite far apart, quite distant, but not quite as far as Swindon and uh, and Gillingham. But similarly, kind of comes back to these grudge matches in the seventies that ended up with you know fights on the pitch and all the rest of it, and off the pitch as well. I guess. Um, so yeah, Swindon and Gillingham had to rather than there was no penalty shootouts or anything like that, so they had another replay at Selhurst Park. Uh, we swing the one two nil. Uh, I didn't go to that game. But I listened to it on the radio, and yeah, that was uh, that was great. So yeah, within two seasons, they'd gone from, you know, oh, actually within just what three seasons, three four seasons, they'd gone from this game that I went to, Swindon Tranmere, where it's, it looked like you know, really that they would be sort of going in the opposite direction to suddenly find themselves in the second tier. And kind of, I guess, going back to that first game, and it's kind of related, is that Swindon shirts that day, uh, we bore the um, the logo of ISIS, the um, local a local building firm, not the you know international terrorist organisation. But it's a it's a good cover. But I guess yeah. they're not the same people. I mean, it would be quite a divergent business model to to go into that but anyway we had isis on our shirts which means it's it's kind of a retro shirt that you probably can't buy and wear anymore um but that was our last season of sponsorship by isis and following the year the local and local insurance company came in um and part of their um part of their sponsorship package was they wanted a high profile manager um and poor old Ken Beamish, who was the Swindon manager, was um, he was offered a job as a, a scout. He rejected it, and so he left. And yeah, Lou Macari came in and just changed everything. Just um, and one of the probably actually the, the next game I went to was when Swindon played uh, Manchester United in a friendly as part of the um, part of the deal. And I think United won four 0 And yeah, that was. Again, that was sort of a great occasion, and just have a bit of glamour at the club, and that that ran that sort of started a a a, line, a run of um, Swindon hiring these sort of glamorous player managers, which you would just wouldn't get these days. Like so, Makari was followed by Ardiles, who was player manager really briefly. Like he only played one or two games, realised he was too old to be playing football in the. Uh, in the championship um, and uh, focused on his football. And then Hoddle came in and we had two seasons of watching Glenn Hoddle. Just amazing now to think of him playing for Swindon and, um, you know, spraying the ball out from the back and just outstanding. Just, yeah, just a privilege to see him play for us. I can't imagine anything like it now or even an equivalent of it happening to, a, you know, a, a sort of provincial championship club. Um, well, who, who would be the, the modern equivalent of Glenn Hoddle? Someone sort of just coming to the end of his career, a classy midfielder who people said that, you know, the, the national team should have been built around. Um, it would be like if they turned out playing for, I don't know, Preston or something. Uh, I don't know. Sorry to pick on Preston, but they're the first club that came into my mind. <laughs> Going back, yeah, so uh, that's just an interesting point, actually, that your string of brilliant player managers, because player managers don't really exist anymore, but no. uh, I mean, they'll be the odd one, but to have, you know, Steve McMahon, to have Glenn Hall, and, and basically brilliant, you know, Ozzy Ardiles just happened to be a World Cup winner. So to have, yeah. you know, Glenn Hoddle is one of the most gifted players we, we've ever had. To have that sort of height of player 
I mean, testing out their management skills, because that was probably one of their first jobs, if not their first jobs. And I, I always remember a video. I'm pretty good on videos. Um, when Gled Hoddle is taking a practice with Swindon, and, you know, they're trying to, you know, I don't know, hit the ball probably in from 20-odd yards, and there are a couple of people failing, and, and Den Hoddle just does it literally yeah. like that. And all the Swindon players go, oh, my life, we, we're never yeah. going to be at that level. And, you know, and again, that points to the the well-worn theory that really good players don't actually necessarily make good managers because they expect yeah. everyone to be at their level. And unfortunately, they're not. And um, that that is something that, you know, as I say, it's a common theme, um, you know, and great managers quite often aren't very good players. So it's the, the vice yeah. versa. I, I want to take you back to the playoffs, I'm afraid. Go on. Yeah. No, please do. I was just going to say one of the players in that in that video, um, and it's a, if you want to watch the whole thing, it's called That's Football, I think, and it's probably on that Swindon Town website. Uh, one of the players is John Moncur, who is, you know, a pretty classy player as well. And yeah, you're right. He's just puffing his cheeks. Can't can't believe that Hoddle is capable of it. And yes, and Hoddle, of course, scored a goal in the player final. Which uh, I, is that what you're about to move on to? You well, I was going to mention that you also made the playoffs in 1988 and 89, but you obviously uh, we don't got need beat, to talk about that. One. Beaten in the semi <laughs> I, I was at the county ground for the first leg, which I believe was another own goal. I think by Jeff Hopkins. Yeah, and then. Yeah. Uh, we managed to squeak past you right and bright at Southers Park, and then went on to the final. But we don't need to talk about that. Let's let's no, not talk. Okay. About, let's talk about um, well another playoff final again, eighty nine ninety. So you went to three playoffs in the space mm. of four years, but eighty nine ninety is a unique playoff final. Uh, and just just tell us a little bit about it for the listeners who don't know the uniqueness of that particular final. Yeah, so Swindon were under investigation for financial irregularities. And before they'd finished, um, I think, fourth or fifth, beaten Blackburn in the playoff semifinals. And the club had offered the Football League and said that we it'd be fairer if you're going to punish us, do it before the playoffs, um, which was an offer that wasn't accepted. So then Swindon went to the playoff final under Ozzy Ardiles, played Sunderland, beat them 1-0. And, and I'm biased, but it's the most one-sided 1-0 one game you've ever seen. It could have been, you know, five or six. And Sunderland fans, I think, would freely admit that, guys who were there. Um and yeah, like uh, how many days later? I think ten days later, they had the hearing at the at the football league, and Swindon were not only was their promotion denied, but they were relegated down to the third division, um, which I think <laughs> for me was as a fifteen year old was a life changing. Well, I kind of uh, set in stone how unfair and cruel the world can be. Um, and there's no denying Swindon had broke the rules. Like it's so many things that they'd been up to um, about illegal payments to players and tax evasion. Um, but what I think what Swindon's argument at the time was, or at least the way I saw it through my sort of rose tinted spectacles, that it was common practice. Like every club was doing this. Every club was given players boot money. Um, and a couple of years later, um, some bigger clubs were also sort of found guilty of doing the same thing, but they could afford a lengthier uh, legal battle. So you think about Tottenham, uh, who were initially kicked out of the FA Cup for financial irregularities and, you know, reinstated. And I think Chelsea as well landed in hot water. Um, but yeah, Swindon were made an example of and they were put back down to the third division and on appeal, they were um, moved back into the into the second tier, um, but that burning sense of injustice uh, remained. And um, you know, even now, you'll find people who will say, "Oh, you know, the football league have got it in for us whenever anything goes wrong." Um, yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, there's there's no denying that that Swindon had broken many rules. Um, but at the same time, it's absolutely heartbreaking when you've you know been to Wembley, and I think that was uh, it's only the second time I'd been to Wembley. I'd, I'd been a few weeks earlier to watch an England game. Um, but yeah, just an amazing occasion. But just to have it taken away was pretty good, and that's kind of why I have sympathy for the fans of clubs who are being punished for financial reasons now it's mm-hmm. you know, it's, these aren't things that, that they've decided or made a choice on it's the actions of their owners and you know the authorities and yeah, it's always the fans who, who get punished and yeah it's a shame <laughs>